just wanted to tell her I watched from London. It's just great. All right, Chris Jones. I'm here. Chris has sent me a Chris has sent me an email and Kevin goes, get your ass over here. I wouldn't miss this um Wagner. I mean Professor Wagner. <laughs> Student days, so it's okay. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone to today's colloquium. Um, despite the sadness of the Middle East, and which, which is also our sadness, we must continue, and um, this is going to be a wonderful talk. So thank you for coming. Um, today, Suzanne preston Blier will be introducing our speaker, a very distinguished historian of African art and architecture in both the history of art and architecture in African and African American Studies Departments here at Harvard. She is the Alan Whitehill Close Professor of Fine Arts and of African and African American Studies. Please welcome Professor Blier. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here and to welcome back Professor Gates from Cambridge and a portrait there of him and you know, it's a, it's a moment of sadness around the globe. It's just so hard. But it's also a moment of celebration and moving forward. So we wouldn't, many of us would not be here without you. I, I can say that for sure. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I don't want to cry. Um, <laughs> um, but it's also my huge honor um, to be asked, to have been asked to introduce Mia Bagnaris, who is an amazing scholar and who I had the deep, wonderful fortune, good fortune of having taught in several classes here. And um, the current project in part emerged out of one of the classes that I um, co-taught with Karen Dalton, which also brings us back into this, um, this collection. And um, the larger issue of the image of the black in Western art. Um, I will say that for any faculty member to watch the amazing success of one's students, there's really nothing quite like it. And, um, but it's not, it's not about me or any other one professor. This is about what the students do, taking the various courses here and then going on and working on their own. And Mia is uh, currently an associate professor of art history and Africana studies in a joint appointment. Uh, at Tulane, and she's also director of the Africana Studies program there. Um, she's got a book coming out in 2024 called Reflame, Reframing Black Art, Case Studies in 19th Century Visual Culture, co-authored with Anna Abinden Kesson. It's coming out with Rutledge, so look for it and order it. Uh, and then her 2018 book, Coloring the Caribbean, Race and Art of Augustino Brunius, which came out with Manchester University Press, and that's a terrific press for these kinds of issues in art history. Uh, if you look at her articles, it's kind of the, the where it's at for all of the most important um, articles uh, to appear, and we should not be surprised. Um, 2022, the radical um, philography of Sarah Maps Douglas in Smart History, 2021, Illuminating the Shadows of Liberty, George Washington and Blackness in American Art, uh, in American Art. The Art Bulletin piece, Miscegenation in Marble, John Bell's Octoroon, that came out in 2020. Others of her articles have come out in anthologies, in the Journal for Contemporary African Art, in Ka, uh, as well as other really important journals in the field. Works underway are several fold, including Imagining the Oriental South, the Enslaved Mixed Race Beauty in British Art and Culture, circa 1865 to 1900, um, which is uh, submitted and uh, to Yale University Press, hopefully uh, already, or at least in the course of this year, which is, will be really wonderful uh, to see. And um, then another work that's coming out on, on the Painting the Queen Black, exploring portraiture, performance, and the materiality of blackface through Indigo Jones' designs for Queen Anne's Mask of Blackness. 
she's got many, many grants, the stellar ones, the important ones, the key ones from British Art Studies to the Mellon Foundation, to a Tulane Research Grant, the American Council of Learned Societies, um, the Paul Mellon Center for the Studies of British Art, and we could go on and on. And the most important of these is here today, that she's a fellow uh, at Harvard. So please join me in welcoming the one and only uh, Mia Bagnaris, who will be speaking on Imagining the Oriental South, the Enslaved Mixed Race Beauty in British Art and Culture, circa 1865 to 1900. Thank you, Susan. because I left my charger for my computer, which will die any moment now, in my office. No, I thought it was in my backpack. Britt, did you just hand me my keys back? Yes, that's right there. I can go back up. Because now I realized it's... No, now I realize... Yeah, it might be. this is mine, but if Yeah, yeah, if I can use it. Surely we have charges. Yeah. Yeah, this should work. And that's an Apple? Every iteration. I will give it back to you after the talk. I realized I plugged my computer in my office and took it out of my backpack, which Britt went to go get. Where did Britt go? Oh, she left again? That was unnecessary. Now I feel really bad. And of course, I came here at like 11.20. And the one thing, they were like, oh, do you have your charger? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, here we go. Um, first, I want to thank Suzanne for that wonderful introduction, very generous. Um, and having Suzanne introduce me and uh, sharing this work in this place today truly feels like a coming full circle. Um, I first encountered the sculpture that anchors this project and upon which I'll be focusing most of um, my talk as a first year, first semester PhD student who at the time had no inkling that she was an art historian um, in a class that, uh, as Suzanne mentioned, she co-taught with Karen Dalton. And I still remember vividly meeting with Karen to discuss potential subjects for my final research paper, um, which she'd laid out in several black and white Xeroxed uh, photocopies, um, these lesser known works that I could consider. And that is where I first met John Bell's Octoroon. Um, although Karen advocated pretty strongly that day that I write about Carpeau's allegory of Africa from the Fontaine de l'Observatoire, uh, I hope she'd be proud of the work that I've done on her second choice object. Um, and although she isn't here in person today, I feel her guidance strongly, um, especially when I'm in this building. And I would like to thank her for making so much of my work possible. Karen might have introduced me to the Octoroon, but it was Suzanne's comment actually on my final paper, which was something along the lines of, brava, I wish I could suggest an appropriate journal for this work that kept the project alive in the back of my mind for nearly two decades. Um, although I was not uh, officially one of her students of the art of Africa, in fact, I wasn't accepted to do art history at all, it was really in her courses that um, I took in my first year of graduate school that I recognized myself as an art historian and felt encouraged to take my scholarship in that direction. So it is no exaggeration to say that I owe much of my career to her. I must also give a shout out to Sheldon Cheek, a fount of knowledge who always knows where to find what I'm looking for and is always, got it, thank you. Thank you so much, Britt, thank you. Quick to, um, and who is quick to respond to any email with exactly the information and the high res image that I need. Um, uh, and I would like to thank Krishna for all of her hard work in coordinating these talks and her encouraging understanding um, in replies to my many anxious emails. Finally, I'm grateful to all of you for being here and a special shout out to my girl, Adrienne Childs, who surprised me with her delightful presence today um, uh, and uh, who featured uh, my beautiful Octoroon um, in part of, uh, in a recent exhibition that she uh, co-curated. I am so honored to have the opportunity to share this work with you um, and I look forward to your feedback. So I will be presenting today from work that is simultaneously old and new. 
uh, new because it's drawn from my current book project, Imagining the Oriental South, the Enslaved Mixed, beauty, mixed Race Beauty in British Art and Culture, circa 1865 to 1900, and old because it actually began with that terrible seminar paper that I wrote about John Bell's Octoroon during my first semester at graduate school <laughs> nearly two years or two decades ago. I wish it was two years. Uh, yes, yeah, so when I published the article, I realized that the scholarship that I had been doing on this object was older than my son, who was getting ready to start <laughs> college. I was pregnant with him my first year of graduate school. So um, when I give this presentation uh, to uh, to, uh, to graduate students, uh, I make the confession as a caveat um, that this work is so old. Um, basically, don't throw anything away and you're never done revising. <laughs> um, That's good. Using works like the two I'll present today, John Bell's Octoroon and Robert Gavin's Quadroon Girl, as case studies, Imagining the Oriental South explores Britain's pronounced and continued fascination with a figure um, that I'll call the enslaved American mixed race beauty even and especially after the abolition of slavery in the United States made the potential political power of such figures as tools for abolition obsolete. It's analysis, it analyzes marked visual and rhetorical echoes between late 19th century representations of the so-called tragic mulatto, quadroon, or octoroon, and concurrent expressions of, oriental, of Orientalism to argue that against the upright image of Victorian England, the American South, and especially Catholic Louisiana, could be imagined as a place of luxury, debauchery, and desire, a perfect echo to the so-called Orient in the British popular imagination, and one made stronger by the perceived association of both regions with the traffic in pretty women, pretty exotic women, as sex slaves. I'll focus primarily today on John Bell's Octoroon as an example of a broader phenomenon I observed before turning to Gavin's Quadroon Girl, tracing connections between both works in order to introduce the concerns of my broader book project. Oh, there's baby grad student Mia. <laughs> On May 23, 1868, the popular British magazine of politics and culture, The Spectator, published the thoughts of a mere visitor on viewing the annual Royal Academy exhibition. Agreeing with earlier pronouncements that declared it a poor year for the RA, the viewer lamented that there were but five or six pictures which next year, one without seeing them again, would be able to recall. That was a quote. They proceeded to detail for the few works worthy of mention. Um, some of the more important and salient information, saving their final notice for a remarkable sculpture by John Bell. Mr. Bell has, in the octoroon, succeeded in carving something which is not merely a stone woman without clothes, as the American with unconscious justice once described a statue before him, but an octoroon, in whose veins, as you can see, there is a tinge of the blood of the South, whose limbs are rounder, whose flesh is pulpier, whose thoughts are fewer, and whose passions are fiercer than those of any child of the North. In describing the figure as more than merely a stone woman without clothes, the reviewer acknowledged Bell's aspiration to sculpt a female nude um, that, like American sculptor Hiram Power's renowned Greek slave, inspired the viewer beyond erotic impulse to the highest echelons of moral and aesthetic contemplation. However, the same reviewer's words also suggest the extent to which the octoroon missed this mark, underscoring his profoundly visceral response in the description of the figure's pulpy flesh and fierce passions. As the groundbreaking work of Joy S. Casson uh, demonstrates, beauties and bondage significantly preoccupied the Victorian popular imagination, and the Greek slave was the mother of them all spawning a number of pale and significantly some not so pale imitators. Given the enormous popularity of the Greek slave and its celebrated display at London's Crystal Palace as part of the Great Exhibition of 1851, there can be no doubt that Bell knew the power's work and registered its notoriety. In fact, Bell had also participated at the Great Exhibition, showing among other things an eight foot cast iron work, The Eagle Slayer, 
Bell was surely disappointed that this merger of art and technology, the first life-size cast iron sculpture ever made, was eclipsed by the unprecedented fame of Powers' sculpture, as was Bell's own captive beauty ex exhibited at the Crystal Palace, a bronze Andromeda, uh, which was later purchased by Queen Victoria for Osborne House and cast in bronze. Powers might have outdone Bell in 1851, However, the octoroon suggests that the English sculptor learned a thing or two from his American peer. A miscegenistic hybrid born of Powers' white marble beauty and the dark horrors of American slavery, Bell's octoroon can be understood both in form and concept as the dusky daughter of the Greek slave. There are striking similarities um, between the octoroon and her Greek form mother make it clear that Bell hoped to replicate Powers' success by replicating his visual and narrative strategies, adapting as closely as possible without direct imitation, powers his composition and theme. However, Bell's sculpture was a repetition with a fundamental difference that critically informed how viewers might perceive the figure. As the remarks of the spectator, re re spectator's reviewers suggest, the exotic racial identity of the octoroon, seven parts white, the last eighth black, could prompt viewers to read cold white marble as hot, sensuous flesh. Scholarship over the past six decades has done much to complicate the legendary prudishness of Victorian Britons. However, as Alison Smith's work illuminates, the status of the nude female subject in art remained highly contested. Indeed, Casson asserts that for 19th century viewers, quote, a nude woman in chains represented an explosive subject, shocking, titillating, potentially even pornographic, end quote. Her important work on 19th century American sculpture in general and on Powers' Greek slave specifically demonstrates the crucial role that narrative played in elevating carvings of stone into works of art sustained, quote, in the words of sculptor Erastus Dow Palmer, by the dignity of moral and intellectual intention." <clears throat> Powers had satisfied public sensibilities by cloaking the Greek slave's unclothed body in an official narrative that, emphasizing moral imperatives, obscured the sculpture's potentially erotic associations. This narrative depended on the audience's familiarity with Orientalist tales of white female captives forced into the sexual slavery of the harem and with relatively recent news reports of white Christian women taken prisoner by so-called lustful Turks during the Greek War for Independence. An explanatory pamphlet often accompanied the work on exhibition, reiterating its narrative context and guiding the viewer's interpretation toward a reading that cast the figure as a paragon of virtue rather than an outlet for illicit ogling. However, applying Powers' strategy of narration to the octoroon did not entail a simple task of translation. For in this case, racial difference made all the difference. As Shermaine A. Nelson's work usefully reminds us, quote, any shift in the racial location of any body provokes new readings and meetings for understanding that body. Unlike her Greek antecedent, Bell's mixed race beauty could not escape popular perceptions that associated her racial designation with sins of the flesh. A fact reinforced by formal deviations. Hold on. Can you give us 30 minutes? We're having a, a seminar. Rio? Okay. Wrap it up, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best with sense of the best. This fact was reinforced by formal deviations between the two works. While Powers' white captive cast her demure gaze over her shoulder and away from her modestly proportioned form, the octoroon abashedly drops her eyes as she regards her own figure. This gesture invites the viewer to do the same, visually caressing her voluptuous body, passing their gaze along her ample bosom, down the curve of her womanly hips, across her fleshy belly and pleasantly plump thighs, and down her legs before terminating at her delicate feet. Moreover, the notion of touch in the sculpture surpasses this merely metaphorical visual caress. The long wavy tresses cast at, cascading down the octoroon's body introduce a textural element that gives the work a sensuous tactile quality. 
Reinforce, reinforcing this sensuous quality, the octoroon then touches herself, using her own hand, a surrogate for the viewers, to pull back the heavy curtain of her hair from her shoulder and expose the full round breast beneath. At once revelatory and inviting, this gesture draws the chain binding her wrists up and across her body. Um, and the almost or ornamental chains, to quote Joseph Roche here, seem to function more as a decoration for the figure's beautiful body than a practical tool of bondage. The links form a diagonal line across her figure from hip, from breast to hip, um, and that encourages the incessant retracing right here of um, the viewer's gaze as it snakes across her curvaceous form. This perpetual loop echoes the vicious cycle of forbidden lust embodied by the octoroon herself. At once the product of illicit sex, she is also understood as destined, however unwillingly, to participate in it. Casson argues that the success of the Greek slave can be largely attributed to Powers' calculative use, in, calculated use of narrative and his confidence that, quote, viewers were already prepared to respond emotionally to a story in which a character very much like themselves was threatened by a mysterious other. Relatedly, consideration of John Bell's octoroon raises the question, what happens when race complicates rather than clarifies dynamics of identification, sympathy, and desire? What happens when the sympathetic uh, figure with whom viewers prescriptively identify is the exotic racial other and the role of the lustful Turk in this case, a libidinous American slaveholder is occupied by a white person just like themselves. And of course, that assumes a white viewer. The sculpture's distinctly American subject and historical circumstances of its first public exhibition, three years after the United States abolished slavery, make all the, these questions all the more compelling. Now, white settlers in British North America and the Caribbean certainly engaged in interracial sex, and mixed race people were hardly a uniquely American phenomenon. Um, and just going to throw this into the mix because I've also worked uh, significantly on this painting, which features Afro Jamaican model uh, Fanny Eaton as the mother of Mo Moses. And I argue that this is a image of uh, Jewish emancipation. Um, being figured by a black woman, sort of two ideas of diaspora and slavery um, that the British um, population felt quite uncomfortable with. Reactions to this painting were very different than their love of the octoroon. Um, but I just, you can ask me about that later. Just threw it in there for fuzzies. Um, from the third, from the mid 19th century forward, um, the formulaic narrative associated with the octoroon as a cultural archetype, which informed Bell's sculpture, had an almost exclusively American subject, or setting rather. Having ended slavery with the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, Britain seemed to have rather immediately forgotten their three centuries of participation in enslaving Africans and their descendants. As Tavia Nyong'o has observed, considering themselves moral leaders on the issue, many were quick to condemn US slavery, seizing on its horrors as evidence of British superiority, while they conveniently forgot the empire's long complicity in the slave trade. The popular association of the octoroon with American slavery allowed Britons to consume the illicit details of her exotic story while distancing themselves from the reality of the sexual abuse of enslaved people under British slavery. Likewise, although Bell's octoroon was certainly designed to pique the audience's uh, outrage over her now obsolete circumstances, the sculpture was just so likely to arouse titillation at the very thought of them. Skipping so I can make the 30 minutes. Pre uh, <laughs> previous studies on the black female subject in the 19th century, uh, or particularly 19th century sculpture, have generally acknowledged and rather quickly dismissed the octoroon, regarding the sculpture as a misguided attempt to capitalize on the popularity of Powers' as Greek slave that failed to reproduce the predecessor's strategic mobilization of narrative. In her study, The Color of Stone, sculpting the black female subject in 19th century America, Nelson suggests that Bell's octoroon lacked, quote, a strong narrative context, which had prepared viewers to accept the Greek slave's nudity. 
She argues that because black female bodies of African descent were understood a priori as sexualized, they generally, quote, did not require elaborate narration to mediate their lack of clothing or sexualized states, end quote. Commenting on Bell's sculpture, Nelson finds that she uh, that the identity of the octoroon is unclear, as is that of her enslaver, the circumstances of her enslavement, and even her location. While Nelson's assertion of the perceived innate sexuality of black female bodies in the Victorian popular imagination is indisputable, um, and I depend on her theorization quite a lot in my work, I argue that popular narratives about enslaved mixed race beauties had in fact prepared British audiences to make sense of the octoroon, and in fact, amplified the titillating uh, potential of this figure. Bell's sculpture would certainly not have been the British public's first encounter with the so-called tragic octoroon, buttressing Joseph Roach's suggestion that the sculpture, quote, ought to be understood as belonging to the international sensation, end quote, created by such narratives. I contend that Bell's octoroon exemplifies a fattest fascination among Britons with tales of young, beautiful, mixed race American slave women during the latter half of the 19th century. The popularity of such tales would have prepared Bell's audience to place the figure in a particular narrative context solely on the basis of the title etched into the base. The, therefore, the problem of John Bell's octoroon was not that she lacked the protective cloak of narrative akin to her Greek predecessor, but that the octoroon's narrative, rather than shielding her erotic body, inevitably advertised it. And I had to cut this from the talk, but I just want to point out, I'm happy to answer a ton of questions about it during q and I just want to point out that um, the octoroon was not Bell's first foray into kind of making an enslaved uh, figure um, akin to the Greek slave in between the two. And in fact, just a few years, two years really, after um, Powers showed the Greek slave at the Crystal Palace, Bell sculpts a daughter of Eve, which is um, a, a bronze figure where I argue the medium is supposed to be a surrogate for race and we are supposed to read her as a dark-skinned figure. Um, if you read the reactions to this work, which was um, displayed as a plaster maquette, which would have likely been um, uh, white or cream, um, though there is one painted version, it always says to be executed in bronze, really highlighting the fact that it was meant to be dark. Um, but one reviewer referred to the work who obviously saw the plaster maquette as a party colored girl. And I, as, as a party colored girl, party. like a, a mixed race oh. woman. Um, and so I think that that might have planted the seed in Bell's head that he might have more success in creating a sympathetic figure if it were not a dark-skinned figure. So ask me about that later. Um, by the time that Bell's octoroon appeared at uh, the Royal Academy, octoroons were apparently all the rage in Great Britain. Commenting on the favorable public sentiment toward them in the beginning uh, of the decade, Lloyd's Weekly reported, it is a, also a repetition of the truth about England, namely that it is, difficulty, it is difficult to obtain sympathy for the blacks, easy to obtain it for quadroons, and impossible to avoid it for octoroons. By the late 1860s, Britons would have been long acquainted with the figure of the enslaved mixed race beauty via the heartrending plights of Eliza, Cassie, and Emmeline from Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. The original 1852 edition included six full color plates, or six full page plates rather, by Hammett Billings, and a deluxe 1853 printing included 117 Billings illustration. English artist George Crixink also furnished illustrations for the novel, creating 27 full page wood engravings in 1852 and adding four to the series the following year. Billings and Crookshank, therefore, familiarized British audiences with melodramatic visual depictions, such as the sympathetic Eliza crossing the Ohio frozen Ohio River to freedom with her babe in arms, or the beautiful quadroon Emmeline on the auction block. Hyped as the follow-up to the success of his hit sensation drama, The Colleen Bond, Dion Boucicault's stage play, The Octoroon, or Life in Louisiana, was the foremost literary production to develop the enslaved mixed-race beauty figure. 
However, by the time it made its London debut at the Adelphi Theater in November 1861, English audiences were apparently already well acquainted with the type. As reviewers in the British press repeatedly dismissed the plot as derivative, asserting that the play was, quote, announced as new and original, but its claims to these epithets is certainly dubious, end quote. The plot of Boussicot's play, in fact, followed very closely that of Thomas Maine Reed's 1856 novel, The Quadroon, a point also noticed by the newspapers. A reviewer for Bristol's Western Daily Press remarked, quote, those who have read Captain Maine Reed's romantic story of the quadroon will find several of its principal features, especially the slave auction, closely reproduced in the play of the octoroon, end quote. This statement suggests, of course, that the reviewer expected that many of the paper's readers had, in fact, read Reed, Maine Reed's novel. Even those of the literate public with the least exposure to so-called high culture could be presumed to be familiar with stories of beautiful mixed-race American slave girls. The Halfpenny Journal, sub subtitled A Magazine for All Who Can Read, published the first installment of Mary Elizabeth Braddon's serial novel, The Octoroon or The Lily of Louisiana. Yes, they all have the same name. Just days before the Adelphi's production of Boussicot's similarly titled play opened. This offered Britain's newly literate urban working class um, their own melodrama of miscegenation and indicated the widespread interest in an accessibility of octoroon literature. Tales of young mixed-race American slave women from this period typically featured the lovely pale-skinned daughter of a benevolent planter, and we know that that didn't really exist, right? No such thing as a benevolent planter, and his enslaved black or mixed-race concubine. The girl is either raised within the household under the impression that her freedom has been secured or reared abroad with no knowledge of her origins. The death of the planter inevitably reveals the enslaved status of the poor girl who now must be sold to satisfy her father's debts. This chain of events thus dooms her romance with a respectable white man and exposes her to the, machina to the machinations of a scheming rival who wants to procure her only to satisfy his illicit desires. Um, now that's just like the standard plot. There are many riffs on it. There's like so many octoroons in Louisiana, um, really too many different titles to count I'm, with so many different riffs. Um, <sighs> Citing the success of Octoroon tales in popular literature and theater in advance of Boussicot's much anticipated drama, the Belfast Morning News reported that the very title Octoroon itself constituted a draw for the public. A powerful stimulant had been given to the interest created for the new drama by the fact that the name had already been disseminated through the medium of halfpenny journals and minor theaters. What an attraction the word Octoroon must have had. Significantly, the abolition of slavery in, in the United States in 1865 did not diminish public interest in the plight of the Octoroon. Princess's Theatre in London revived Boussicot's drama in 1868, the same year that Bell's Octoroon appeared at the Royal Academy, and the play was still drawing an audience 10 years later when it ran at Duke's Theatre. Um, and I should say, even well into almost the turn of the 20th century in the 1890s, in little tiny mill towns in Lancashire, church productions of, it's like the, the American trio, it's like the white Negro, the octoroon, and like the quadroon girl are being um, offered up by like, temperance theater groups. Um, by this time, octoroon tales were so ingrained in the public imagination that the press regarded the show um, at Duke's Theater as, quote, a rather hackneyed picture of the wrongs of American slavery in the southern states of America before the emancipation. Belonging, the graphic reported, to its own class of plantation dramas, which increased sympathy is sought to be awakened by representing the heroine as so nearly a white woman that no subtle art of chemistry could be expected to detect her true origins, end quote. The public's fascination with octoroons meant that Bell, much like Powers, could in fact presume his viewers capable of placing the sculpture in an appropriate narrative context, simply based on the provocative title uh, etched into the sculpture's base. 
Bell not only counted on the attraction the word must have had, but that the power of this designation carved into the base so that the figure and its narrative could not be separated would transform viewers' understanding of the work before their very eyes. Minus the title Octoroon, the beautiful captive hewn of white marble with idealized conventionally European features and long flowing hair would most likely have been read as a wanton white woman. With it, she became a tragic figure worthy of the viewer's sympathy. The title Octoroon might have served as a draw for viewers and provided in a single word enough information to construct a narrative context that elucidated the sculpture. However, even as it prompted compassion for the enslaved girl's plight, that narrative, particularly in conjunction with visual cues, emphasized her sinful origins and unthinkable and very imminent fate. Um, implicit in the sculpture's title, explicit in the figure's pale body, and exaggerated by her rendering in white marble was a vicious cycle of forbidden lust, of white for black, master for slave, as each successive generation of illicit desire produced a beauty paler and more coveted than the last. Since the development of the female nude as a subject in art, certain rigid codes, for example, the absence of body hair, um, the strategic covering or editing of genitalia, have governed its representation, distinguishing it as an ideal of perfection, altogether different from the banal sort of realness of the merely naked human body. Moreover, Victorian artists and audience privileged white marble as the perfect medium for expressing the idealism of the nude, a fact that cannot be divorced from the relationship between physical whiteness and Western ideals of female beauty. Making this connection plain, art critic uh, James Jackson Jarves remarked in 1855, quote, female loveliness is the most fascinating type of humanity. In it, we have the highest development of both color so female lo loveliness must be inherently connected to whiteness, and form as united in beauty. For him and the culture that he represented, whiteness and feminine beauty were inextricably linked. A multivalent signifier, the whiteness of marble in ideal sculpture, might convey a number of ideas and meanings. Associated with the abstraction of ideas and the purity of form, it confirmed an ideal it confirmed ideal sculpture as high art and solidified the genre's relationship to, high, to the highest morality. As Michael Hatt notes, quote, whiteness served as a moral index, the color of purity, permitting the representation of ideal flesh, not in the least in the nude, but setting clear lines and, or rather limits to erotic force, end quote. Indeed, some neoclassical critics and sculptors extolled the beauty and power of white marble to such an extent that Nelson characterizes its use as, quote, a conscious ideological choice. White marble served a regulatory function transforming the biological body into a work of art with moral merit. Hatt rightly contends that the condemnation of colored sculptures, that is, tinted or painted works, typically associated with the Victorian period, exemplified by John Gibson's notorious tinted or painted Venus has been overstated. He argues indeed that Gibson's work more often, quote, incited debate and doubt rather than outright condemnation, end quote. However, the fact that colored marble sculptures could ignite even debate, let alone outright moral or condemnation, indicates the, the association of color with marble sculpture was a still contentious enterprise with implications for the octoroon. Reproducing the natural flesh tones of white skin and the animation of human flesh, cultured, colored sculptures rather, might evoke real female bodies and the sexuality associated with them rather than the lofty ideals to which neoclassical sculptures ostensibly aspired. The Ogderoon offered the unique opportunity to provide the viewer with a white marble sculpture in which the controversial connotations often linked to color, realness, and, sensu and sensuality were narratively implied rather than materially explicit. Moreover, no straightforward merger of the ideal and the real, this knotty nexus came with its own set of complex and problematic implications, as whiteness in the case of the octoroon connoted something very different from its usual associations. 
While white marble might convey the highest ideals of Western civilization, all that was moral and good and true and pure, the whiteness of the octoroon carried a double meaning, simultaneously suggesting all of these things while also emphasizing their opposites. Worthy of her marble medium, the enslaved mixed race beauty as portrayed in the period literature is in her heart a paragon of metaphysical whiteness as informed by feminine ideals. She is sweet and gentle, virtuous and pure. At the same time, her physical whiteness, her pale complexion, marks her as a tainted thing, a product of illicit sex who cannot escape the realities of the consequences of her imperceptible blackness, which, in the sense that it is responsible for her sensual allure, is, to borrow Michael Hatt's formulation, irredeemably physical. In contrast to the typically abstract, unmarked invisibility of whiteness in ideal sculpture, the octoroon's whiteness is both hypervisible and insistently corporeal, drawing the viewer's attention to the reality of her body and, I would argue, to the abuses and the potential pleasures it represents. The octoroon in her very whiteness bears the mark of the abusive realities of slavery on her body. Her whiteness, even as it is meant to be beautiful, is itself an ugly scar. Furthermore, although the octoroon's whiteness is irredeemably physical as the source of the figure's erotic allure, so too is the invisible blackness that this whiteness contains. Because the octoroon's African ancestry is generally described as visually imperceptible, rendering the figure in white marble with conventionally idealized European figures made sense, but the title etched into her base would have encouraged viewers to imagine, as the spectator's mere visitor had done, something beyond the surface of the marble, to see in their minds, if not with their eyes, the tinge of the blood associated with her African ancestry that animated the so-called fierce passions beneath it. Understanding the illicit backstory associated with the octoroon's racial origins and projecting the implications of perceived black female hypersexuality onto her white-looking body depended on placing the figure within the context of American slavery, especially the traffic in enslaved near-white beauties known as the fancy trade, uh, which was particularly associated with Louisiana. The popularity and formulaic nature of octoroon narratives meant that Bell could count on his viewers to locate the figure in the deep American South, and I argue even more specifically in Louisiana, where the majority of octoroon tales take place. The Louisiana setting constituted such a hallmark of the genre that it is explicitly named in the subtitles of a number of literary treatments. For example, Reads the Quadroon, or Lover's Adventures in Louisiana, Brucey Coe's The Octoroon, or Life in Louisiana, Braden's The Octoroon, The Lily of Louisiana, and D.W. Dunn's Cora, or The Octoroon Slave of Louisiana. Moreover, Bell, like Powers, used visual clues to connect this sculpture to its supporting narrative and its exotic southern location. While the support on which the Greek, uh, the Greek slave rests her hands is adorned with a locket and a cross to signify the captive's Christian faith in the home and family from which she has been torn, the fingers of the octoroon graze a draped column ornamented with a bunch of flowers. The bouquet droops as though poised inevitably to fall to the ground, and the most prominent of its flowers is a magnolia blossom. Popularly associated with the Deep South and the state flower of Louisiana, the Magnolia grandiflora, picture that, yeah, is known for its white velvety petals, which echo the suggestion of the octoroon's touchable flesh. After magnolias fall to the ground, their white flowers turn brown and their downy petals go slimy. Don't try walking down a Louisiana sidewalk when it's magnolia falling season. A suggestive metaphor for the African heritage beneath the pale skin of the octoroon that in the Victorian popular imagination doomed her to a shameful fate. Exemplifying this metaphor, the undisputed climax of octoroon dramas that most captivated the British audience was the public auction scene, in which the near-white beauty stands before the crowd on the auction block, typically with the respectable white suitor and the scoundrel who aims to force her into concubinage engaged in a bidding war. 
When Boucicault's Octoroon played at the Adelphi Theater in 1861, a London Times critic described the public's slave sale as one of two, quote, sensation scenes that would most appeal to the public. And it became a stock episode in Octoroon works, repeatedly rehearsed not only in fiction, but in visual art as well. In addition to being featured in reviews and advertisement for Boucicault's play and in illustrated literary treatments of the Octoroon, the auction scene also caught the attention of painters. Um, for example, in a painting from the 1850s, an unidentified American artist um, depicts a public slave auction in which a light-skinned woman in a pale pink gown takes center stage. Although she does not stand nude before her would-be purchaser, she remains exposed, her off-the-shoulder frock revealing her arms and decolletage. The auctioneer stands just behind her, literally pointing out her charms as a prospective buyer takes her arm, inspecting his potential acquisition more intimately. Meanwhile, another man leans back, chin in hand, assessing the merits of her purchase, such that Hugh Honor notes, quote, contemporaries would have had no doubt of the fate of this almost white girl. Um, Thomas Noble also featured a mixed race slave girl at the center of his version of his most ambitious work, The Slave Mart, uh, originally from 1865, which is now known only through an 1871 copy in which he replaced the Octoroon girl who'd fallen out of favor in the US by that time um, with a mother and child. The work included more than 75 figures, nearly but nearly all of the critics made special mention of the, um, as she's called in one review, the parti colored girl. Um, in, the, in the center on a raised platform is portrayed a young girl, an octoroon we should say, who is made to look so innocent and modest with such beautiful eyes so meekly cast down as to call forth sympathy for her fate. The critics' descriptions indicate how precisely Noble had managed to translate the hallmarks of the octoroon genre from literature to paint, adhering to a model maintained by Busico, Braddon, and others that cast the figure as a sympathetic victim of her situation, a respectable girl whose virtue is imperiled by her circumstances. These texts also suggest that, like the prescribed storyline that characterized the genre, the beauty of the octoroon followed a template that artists, including Bell, used to make their works liter uh, legible to the public. Indeed, Octoroon represented such an established physical type that Braden's literary rendering of the slave sale of the Octoroon character Cora could just as easily have been the gallery text for Bell's sculpture. Her face was mighty than marble. Her eyes, her dark, large dark eyes were shrouded beneath their drooping lids, fringed with long and silking lashes. Her rich wealth of raven hair had been loosened by the rude hands of the overseer and fell in heavy masses below her waist. The octoroon's haunting dark eyes, shaded by long lashes, were always downcast, simultaneously signaling her modesty and her shame. But the figure's long, wavy hair was perhaps her most essential physical characteristic. Rarely could a mixed-race beauty be mentioned without reference to this cascading mass, um, with special emphasis on its length and texture, implicating her as the product of multiple generations of interracial sex. The long flowing tresses of Belle's octoroon are perhaps the most striking deviation um, from the Greek slave, contrasting sharply with the neatly contained chignon of Powers' model and underscoring the imperiled virtue of the octoroon girl. Considering that the public auction scene was a characteristic feature of octoroon literature and indeed one of the most popular uh, hallmarks of the genre, viewers almost certainly understood Bell's octoroon to be standing before them as though on the auction block. Herself a white flower about to be plucked and destined just like the magnolia blossom at her side to fall. Michele Boninsegna's now lost 1864 sculpture, La Schiava de Nudata, described as, quote, the daughter of a slave mother and presumably a white slaveholder, who is sent to be sold in the market, stripped of her clothes to the last shred before jeering men, end quote. Attests to the popularity of this kind of subject matter and the public's fascination with the tragedy of the Octoroon's imminent violation. Um, and, you know, even as late as 1874. 
Referring to Bonian Senya's sculpture, a period commentator reported, quote, rough hands will deflower that perfect flesh and no humiliation of the horrible transaction will be spared her. Honor rightly observes that the writer's words, quote, echo the rhetoric of the abolitionists, but like the statue itself, seem to have been calculated to ex excite more prurience than pity a decade after the last sale of slaves in the United States, end quote. The commentator's vivid language suggests the that 19th century Europeans invoking the language of abolition, even and especially after it had already been enacted, used such work as license to ruminate on and discuss otherwise unspeakable subjects. The viewers of the Octoroon, uh, that the viewers of the Octoroon occupied a position identical to that of the spectator at a slave auction becomes doubly significant when considering that the sculpture itself, like an object available for purchase, would have, um, or the subject itself, which was itself an object available for, for purchase, would, like an enslaved fancy girl, have declared the status of the buyer. Now, clearly, there exists a significant world of difference between buying a sculpture and buying a person, and this difference should not be minimized for the sake of clever argument. Uh, nonetheless, Thorsten Veblen's <coughs> assertion that the more removed an object is from practical use, the more effectively it indicates the, its owner's wealth and status, does illuminate some of the dynamics at work in the Octoroon. Most ideal sculpture was purchased by wealthy patrons for individual homes to be put on display for guests and for the personal gratification of the owner. Light-skinned enslaved women sold as fancy girls were also bought often for the personal gratification of their owners. Like works of art, they were purchased because they were beautiful, not because they were useful. As historian Walter Johnson has observed about the fancy trade, the gaze of the consumer projected the fantasy of white masculinity onto the bodies of light-skinned slave women. Fancy was a transitive verb made noun, a slaveholder's desire made material in the shape of a woman. For slave buyers, near white enslaved women symbolized the luxury of being able to pay for service, often sexual, that had no material utility. They were fancies, projections of the slaveholder's own imagined identities as white men. Now, buying the work of a fashionable sculpture like Bell was not within the reach of most Britons in 1868. However, Bell, along with ceramics manufacturer Mittens Limited, solved this problem and was able to offer middle-class buyers who could not afford a full-size sculpture the luxury of looking by authorizing the mass production of an eight-inch miniature of the Octoroon. And I'm sorry that David is not here today, um, though he has heard versions of this talk before, because he owns one. I am jealous. Um, <laughs> And originally, it had uh, real silver uh, shackles um, that are missing from every extant model, probably because the silver was worth something. <laughs> um, these were made of Parian ware, a bisque porcelain used uh, for popular collectibles during the Victorian period that imitated the look of marble. This miniature miscegenated maiden included a real silver chain um, that connected the manacles on her wrist, and faithfully reproducing the original the tiny tragic octoroon even included the magnolia flower, most, but most significantly, the miniature also replies the title etched into the base. Now, this is a feature that is not included on uh, any other scaled-down figurine of um, bells that Minton produced, um, but it is one that ensured that the statuette's narrative always accompanied her figure and that she could be understood in this narrative context. With the Mittens miniature octoroon, middle-class Victorian viewers could invite this pale beauty into their parlors where they might freely gaze upon her, even handle her, and imagine her dreadful lot. From the privacy of their own chintz upholstered armchairs, they were at liberty to conjure a mental image of the octoroon's rough hands loosening her raven tresses, to witness, perhaps at his insistence, her own hand pulling uh, these locks back to reveal her breasts and to indulge in their own fantasies of her body, all under the protective guise of their no longer useful moral outrage. Now, Edward Said describes the Western imagined Orient um, that featured in the types of narratives associated with the Greek slave as, quote, an invention, a place of romance, exotic beings, haunting memories and landscapes, remarkable experiences. 
These words also perfectly capture the image of the American South and particularly Catholic Louisiana in the Victorian popular imagination. Thus, in its association with heat, color, and passion, antebellum Louisiana constituted a powerful echo to the imagined Orient, one rendered more resonant by the association of both regions with the sexual enslavement of beautiful, exotic women. Just as Powers' Greek slave exploited viewers' perceptions of the Oriental harem, Bell's octoroon depended on their understanding of the South as a sort of American Orient. That Bell was not the only 19th century British artist to capitalize on the parallels between the Orient and the American South indicates the pervasiveness of such connections. The Quadroon Girl, um, a an 1872 painting by Scottish artist Robert Gavin perfectly illustrates these resonances. In contrast to Bell, whose knowledge of the subject uh, was derived solely from literary and journalistic accounts, Gavin toured the United States after the Civil War and visited Louisiana around 1868. Apparently becoming enamored with the exotic racial types he encountered there, he completed a number of studies of black and mixed race subjects um, and these works uh, were recently acquired by uh, the Williams College uh, Museum of Art, and I'm going to go see them next week. Um, later, the painter traveled uh, throughout North Africa and made a name for himself as a painter of Morris subjects. The striking similarities between New Orleans Flower Girl and Moorish Maiden's First Love reinforce the connections that I'm attempting to draw out here. In general, British Orientalists preferred less salacious scenes, depicting the harem, for example, as a woman-centered domestic space rather than focusing on public sales of harem girls like their French counterparts. Uh, Gavin's treatment of North African subjects generally corresponds to, this, to these kind of less racy themes that characterize British Orientalism. For example, while he certainly means for the viewer to find the dark-skinned girl in The Moorish Maiden's First Love attractive, she's fully dressed and the painting is not defined by its erotic overtones. Conversely, in his painting The Quadroon Girl, the artist calls on the erotically charged visual lexicon of French Orientalism to treat the distinctly American subject of the enslaved mixed race beauty. Gavin's picture features a lovely saffron-skinned girl who stands topless before two men, ostensibly a slave trader, and her father, the white planter. The catalog entry for the painting from the 1872 Royal Scottish Academy exhibition featured a stanza from American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, The Quadroon Girl, indicating that the identi identically titled poem, which itself has explicit Orientalist overtones, was a point of inspiration for Gavin. Visual echoes between the verses of the, and the picture are evident in the figure of the quadroon maiden, whom Longfellow describes as wearing nothing, quote, save a kirtle bright and her own long raven hair, end quote. However, the narrative of the poem, which revolves around a planter selling his mixed race daughter to a slave trader due to his financial insolvency, does not entirely correspond to the painting. Playing cards scattered across the floor in the image suggest that the beautiful quadroon girl has just been gambled away. As the straw-hatted planter solemnly regards the girl, bringing his hands together before him in a gesture of resignation, the slave trader, a lecherous gleam in his eye, leans in to whisper something to him, perhaps a catalog of the <coughs> services she might perform for him once he takes her to quote Longfellow's poem, to be his slave and paramour in a strange and distant land. End quote. Gavin's quadroon bears all the hallmarks of the prototypical enslaved mixed race beauty, dark eyes, heavily veiled long lashes, gaze directed at the floor as a mane of thick waves cascades down her back. However, the bare chested girl, naked save knee length harem style trousers secured with a deep purple scarf wound about her waist and a gold bangle, let's go back to the big one, um, fixed around her upper arm, appears like something out of a painting by Jérôme, more oriental than American. The lighting and use of color, the dilapidated elegance of the interior also recall French Orientalist painting. A comparison to Gabin's later clearly Orientalist biblical painting um, 
It's probably Naaman the leper and the little Jewish maid, um, but it was advertised at auction as two men and a young girl in an oriental interior. Um, dramatic, the, com the similarities here dramatically underscore this notion of the plantation south as an American Orient. In it, the artist painted a nearly identical scene to the quadroon girl, replacing the slave trader and the planter with a servant and the listless Syrian commander, Naaman, but keeping the figure of the girl virtually unaltered, except, ironically, for more modest clothing. In applying a French Orientalist aesthetic to his treatment of the enslaved mixed race beauty, Gavin traces echoes between the depra perceived depravity of the Louisiana plantation and that of the Oriental harem. Others, like American abolitionist Thomas Wentworth Higginson, asserted this relationship more directly. Compared to the American South, Higginson declared, quote, a Turkish harem is a cradle of virgin purity, end quote. 19th century opponents of slavery imagined, quote, illicit intercourse was embedded into the very conditions of Southern life, and the South was a society in which man's sexual nature had no checks put upon it. That's Ronald Walters. Many Britons shared this view of the South and the debauched decadence of its planters. The declaration in Braden's Octoroon that, quote, the reader is already acquainted with the laxity of Louisianian morals, indicates the lasciviousness of the American slaveholder was so notorious among Britons that it required no explanation. Gavin's Quadroon Girl and Bell's Octoroon reveal the enduring power of the enslaved mixed race American beauty, even after the abolition of American slavery rendered the figure an obsolete tool of political propaganda. Like the period's Orientalism, in a carefully calculated synthesis between the preachy and the potentially pornographic, works like these suggested a long catalog of sexual sins that had to be imagined graphically before they could be properly condemned. Restoring the Octoroon's period context reveals that the sculpture's problem was not that it had no strong narrative to protect her from, not that she had no strong narrative to protect her from the viewer's lustful gaze, Clearly, British audiences were well acquainted with and captivated by her tragic tale. No, the Octoroon's problem, which I suggest was not so much a problem, but actually the very logic by which the sculpture worked, was that the narrative could not overcome and indeed reinforced its association with illicit sex. Despite the near whiteness of the Octoroon's race and the actual whiteness of her marble figure, the racial difference sexualized Work from the, the work from the start. When Blackburn, a tiny cotton town in the Midlands, acquired the Marble Beauty in 1876 as the center of its municipal art collection, and there's a story there, feel free to ask me, the local paper declared, no one with the least feeling for art can look on the sculpture without feelings of admiration for it and a longing to be the possessor of it. Likewise, that's the end of the quote, likewise, the mere visitor to the Royal Academy could at once admire the alabaster loveliness of the Octoroon's white marble form and imagine her a real woman, brought to life and pulsing with erotic energy, invigorated by the one drop of African blood coursing through her marble veins. That's all I got. Me about that one too. <laughs> <laughs> about which one? It is ostensibly a bronze version of the Octoroon, but not. When did this genre end? Never. <laughs> 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 um, I don't think it really ends. I think that what I am tracing is um, the way in which the cultural work that this figure does. Um, the way it does this, this particular cultural work at this particular time. I think the idea of a fascination with a mixed race beauty, that, that, that's still ongoing, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, I mean, we've seen Queen Charlotte, right? Um, but that in every period, in every context, it has a very specific resonance. It can do very particular, I think, both political and cultural work. And the prevailing understanding of the work that this figure does in the 19th century is as a tool of abolition. Um, and so when I was noticing that so many of these works pop up 10 years 
you know, five years, 10 years, even 15, 20 years after abolition, I was interested in why, especially, and I would say that what makes this figure different than, say, what we see with a sort of tragic Octoroon or tragic mulatto literature of the 20th century is that these figures are actually enslaved figures, right? Mm -hmm. If we're thinking about reading something like, I don't know, Nella Larson's Passing, right? Um, those characters are free. They're living in their time. I'm interested in why Britons are excited to like not bring that figure into you know the 1870s and present mm. a, woman, a mixed race woman from the 1870s. Why are they still interested in presenting this figure as like tragically enslaved on a Louisiana plantation? How do you define an octoroon, Professor? <laughs> How do I define an octoroon? Yeah, what um, is an octoroon? I'd, well, first of all, I would never really try to do that. In terms, I define a type, right? And so even though this work, say, is called the Quadroon Girl, and that's part of the reason why I've changed it to the enslaved mixed race beauty, mm -hmm. is that I can get outside of having to deal with both, well, I won't say having to deal with, but it does allow me to speak very specifically about this figure and to not necessarily get into all of the iterations that come before and after. like. Officially, even according to, well, actually, it's quite interesting when John Bell displays this work at the Royal Academy, he gets the, he gets the math wrong. So an octoroon is ostensibly seven, eight, seven eighths white and one eighth black. Mm -hmm. um, but he does, I, I don't actually remember exactly, uh, I have it somewhere, what he says, but he gets the math wrong uh, and does not represent a, a mathematical Octoroon. I'm less interested in the blood quantum um, and more interested in this specific figure who follows this specific kind of stock tale. Mm -hmm. um, and hence, by using like mixed race enslaved or mixed race beauty, I, of, I am able to talk about this particular genre and this particular stock image sure. without necessarily having to think too much about the things that might, a, a figure who might fit the definition of an octoroon, um, which wasn't actually used in Louisiana censuses all that much, um, mm -hmm. without um, having to make too much of a foray mm -hmm. into all of the different kind of iterations it, it takes. Well, I think that's smart. Thanks. Because then it lets you um, be more encompassing. I learned how to be smart in your program. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a difference between a white person who's one eighth black and a black person, let's see, a white, an octoroon would be one eighth, right? So if in a sentence someone said, she is a white person who's one eighth black, as opposed to a black person. That would not have flown in the United States or in Britain. What, in, which what? In, 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 at the time that these no, works are No, they wouldn't have said, this is a white person who's one eighth black. Who's one -eighth black. Well, in fact, so. They would have said the other way around. My daughter um, has a good friend uh, who's, uh, her, she was born in, in New Orleans. Her, family, her father's from Puerto Rico. She keeps talking about the fact that she has this, this black grandfather, but she very much considers herself white. And my daughter is read all of my material and she's like, oh my gosh, Elodie's an octoroon. <laughs> I was like, you cannot go to school and tell Elodie she is an octoroon. Um, like, I think that part of, you know, and the idea of visual perception, like so much of people are like, what is the common thread in your work? Um, one of the common threads in much of my work is thinking about um, the fact that uh, race is an idea that is inevitably uh, tied to visual perception. It's rooted in the visual. We cannot describe it really without describing, uh, without relying on visual terms. But the fact that someone can be black but look white mm -hmm. inevitably points to the kind of artificiality yeah, and, and constructedness of race. Right. It points to, the, it, the, to it as a socially constructed idea. Right. Um, and I'm interested in probing all of the, all of the, all of the spaces in there. So my first book um, dealt a lot with construction of race in the Caribbean, but was really like, the thing that started that was an interest in these figures of ambiguous race, those that could not, upon sight, be understood as either um, white or of color, and how that really 
blew the minds of folks in the 18th century Caribbean. Um, and I think that the reason why the octoroon can do the work that she does, as I was trying to point out in the section where I was really thinking about medium, is because she can, she carries all of the visual connotations that are associated with white beauty. And in some, to some extent, actually, um, like in the literature, the octoroon character is always imagined as more beautiful than the, than the sort of her, her white um, nemesis. Um, in part because of these kind of hallmark features, um, but that she also carries all of the connotations that are associated with um, kind of black hypersexuality that existed in the right. 19th century. Right. So she is virtuous and pure and like, you know, you are allowed to, to like her, but she can't get away from her irresistible allure mm -hmm. that is rooted somewhere in her body, even if it right. is imperceptible. No, I ask because they do make a distinction between a quadroon mm -hmm. and an octoroon. And then, uh, even you ended with the, the one drop rule. And what, what would one, one drop out of 100? One drop out of how many drops? Who knows? Yeah, you know, how many? And then, when you look at modern, you know, contemporary genetics, um, the average African American is 24% um, European, right? So, what the hell kind of, is that a quadroon? Is that a... You know what I mean? It's it's weird. I refuse to get the test done. My poor sister had it done. It blew her mind. She knew, like, it's the sort of thing where you know something factually, mm -hmm. you know, like based on what you know of your family's history. Um, but it's different to see it on paper. She was like, I am practically a mulatto. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how is this a surprise to you? Well, if you change your mind upstairs, mm -hmm. I have a limitless supply. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> final, final thing. Uh, could you go back to Moses's wife? It's Mo it's it's so this is uh yes it is the actually the mother and the sister of Moses. Oh, I thought it was. So though you are right, there is actually a 17th century Dutch painter, Jordans, who does an image of Moses and his Kushite wife, Zipporah. Yeah, his second wife. I just um, want everybody to know right. that Moses' second wife was a black woman. She was from the kingdom of Kush. Well, there is a lot of argument, actually, as to whether or not it's the second wife or the same wife. Oh, really? I'm, yes. Oh, okay. You want, well, you want to you talk Bible would, and Talmud? I'm with you there. I'll, I'll have a long <laughs> conversation with no, you. No, I'm happy. I would, <laughs> I would prefer it to be his first wife. Um, <laughs> but, but there's no controversy about what the kingdom of Kush was. The kingdom of Kush was a kingdom of black people. It's Nubia. Kush, Nubia, between... Khartoum and what is now the Aswan Dam. Boom. Well, Fanny Eaton was from neither of those places. She's from Jamaica, St. Andrews, uh, <laughs> and uh, left Jamaica to uh, live in England with her mother. Uh, she was a favorite model of the pre-Raphaelite circle. Um, this work by Simeon Solomon is, I believe, the first painting to feature her. He was, he probably brought her to the attention of the pre-Raphaelites, because mm. um, his sketches are the earliest ones of her. Um, and she is the model for both the mother and the sister of Moses here. So uh, here she is the mother, Yocheved. Here she is uh, Moses' sister, Miriam. And in the reviews of this work, the c critics called her, called, they, they like universally praised the picture, but the model was too Jewish, too Egyptian, too Coptic, too something. The one thing they wouldn't come out and say was, this woman is too black. Right. Right? Um, but for me, it's this kind of like the pre Raphaelites are very into choosing the perfect model to portray their figures, this truth to nature. And he has chosen a model who, in her very body, right, carries the history of slavery and diaspora in the British Empire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to represent the mother and sister of a painting that is about slavery and diaspora. Now, my final question is the, uh, the mass produce, I was most fascinated by the mass produce, how tall were they? Eight inches? 18 inches. 18 inches. Would that be? one of the first mass-produced soft porn figures? Because clearly it is, right? 
Um, I don't know about that. <laughs> That's going to introduce a whole new element into my research. You want me to research soft porn sculptural <laughs> images? Um, well, they're all soft porn. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, these kind of Parian ware figures were quite popular. The Greek slave also was produced as a Parian ware figure. Bell has a number of his other works that are produced in Parian ware as well. What is interesting to me about this one, which I highlighted in the talk, is the way in which other kind of key, that oftentimes you have to edit out some of the details from the large right. version of the sculpture for mass production. And so in his other works where the title of the work might have been on the base of the sculpture or there might have been accessories that kind of connote part of the story um, that get edited out from the Parian ware version, he's kept the magnolia flower um, and the word octoroon. Um, these are the things that tell you this isn't just a white lady with long hair. Right. Right? Um, and the reason why I find this work so interesting, so I'm sorry for the terrible image. I don't know where to get a better one of it. Um, I pulled it off the web from an auction catalog. Um, it was auctioned off at Sotheby's, I think in like, maybe Christie's, in uh, the, like, around 2009, um, and it was advertised as the Octoroon. Now, I'm going to argue that this is not the Octoroon because it does not say the Octoroon, and she does not have a magnolia flower. This is just a bronze captive with long hair. <laughs> um, and so Bell often repeated the same figure or slightly tweaked a figure but it, thinking about what produces context to a figure tells the viewer how to encounter and how to read it. Was there anybody um, producing figures of white women from Russia, say, or white women from France, contemporary white women? I mean, what I'm trying to, what occurred to me from your excellent presentation is that, okay, here's the goal to represent the white female body. So how can they do it legitimately? Legitimately, quote unquote. Well, we can uh, do an ancient, a Greek woman, boom, boom. That's gone. Or the exotic other. But could they represent a white woman, you know, from France or England or the United States in um, sculpture at, at that time? I'm guessing no, but. Sheldon? <laughs> My, I mean, my guess would be not really. And in fact, they couldn't even really do a, a dark-skinned black woman. So one of the things that in other versions, parts of this talk, or, or in, in the extended chapter in the book, I talk about is the kind of real failure of a daughter of Eve, even though it is a beautiful sculpture, um, because it... Can't, like there, it was not possible to represent a dark-skinned black woman as a true nude, as in completely uncovered. Notice she's draped, um, and I go way back to my extra slides. That is very much part of a tradition. We go all the way back to 1801 with the voyage of the sable Venus. We have. What my students, they, so I gave my students an assignment to do a visual analysis of this. Do not look at anything, only use your eyeballs. They all describe those little panties as an embroidered girdle. And I was like, y'all looked up stuff on the web. <laughs> but wait, you, she's, wearing like, um, uh, she's wearing something to cover her nether regions, right? Um, and you know, Alice Walker famously remarked upon Judy Chicago's dinner party, right? Everybody else gets a creatively imagined vagina, but <laughs> to imagine that black women have vaginas is going too far. Um, so you don't really get true nudes of even dark-skinned uh, women of African descent before the 20th century. Um, to sculpt a contemporary white woman as a true nude, I think would definitely have caused a stir. That's why we're going through all of these different kind of sideways. But I don't think that necessarily, I don't think that the object that any of these artists had on their mind, either um, explicitly or even subconsciously, was, I'm going to make something titillating. Um, it was just that, like, 
hmm, I'm going to sculpt an octoroon. It's got to be titillating, right? There's no way to get outside of titillation when we're talking about uh, the, the octoroon in the late 19th century. Or Greek slave. Or the Greek slave. Good, thank you. It's great. I don't think we should follow up on that discussion with any other questions. <laughs> I, I was just so fabulous. Um, I, I am curious at the Crystal Palace and other um, fairs, if one is not seeing in the sculpture gardens other white women, that, that would be one area to look at as well. But I, I wanted to also really commend you on bringing the issue of Orientalism to the Americas because I hadn't seen it done before, and there's something about the Americas that's so kind of exceptionalism, and I think that that's just wonderfully grounded in the same way that somebody recently brought American colonialism to discussions about the American West, which is you know, a key piece of this, and, and wondering at the same time, you're focusing on the British, the French might be equally um, uh, interesting to explore from that same vantage point. But I also have a question on a kind of later date mm -hmm. thing, which is in, by the 1920s and 30s, we have in eugenics in play here and elsewhere, just hardcore eugenics internationally and locally, which is taking this whole subject and turning it on its head and saying that the, the subjects of interracial marriage are in, in many ways deformed and um, you know, of, of less intelligence and all the rest of it. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a moment of that transition, w which is such a horrible one, and how that, was there a kind of sense that um, the emphasis on the beauty and on the importance and on the, the, the reality of interrace Sexual encounter, if not marriage, is something somehow all of a sudden we have to we have to cut off entirely. And just wondering, going forward, I, and I'm not sure that I can imagine any real arts around eugenics, except in Cambridge, we all of a sudden discovered that the Vikings were here, and there, there's yeah. monuments to that presence, which is kind of saying it in a different way. Well, I mean, uh, I mean two things. One, I think that actually these works are also implicated in conversations about um, uh, certainly a kind of scientific racism in the 19th century. Um, elsewhere I've talked about how um, part of the reason for the failure of, of A Daughter of Eve, which was a work that in its title signs the idea of monogenesis, right? That we're all descendants of um, Adam and Eve and fought contemporary scientific debates about polygenesis um, that were um, visualized, um, for example, in this work, The Types of Mankind and Not in Glidden. Um, but it was impossible, for me it's about, because thinking aesthetically, there was a way in which blackness and beauty were impossible for the Victorian mind to bring together. Um, this is a quote about uh, this work from the Manchester Guardian. Uh, where I talk about how the, how the critic goes through a kind of rhetorical gymnastics to not call the woman beautiful, right? Young and drooping in spirit, yet with raised head and eyes, uplifted in mutely eloquent appeal to Helen. Stands, heaven stands this poor daughter of Eve. A true Negro, as her woolly hair and general, genuine African contour reveal, but though her race is inevitably stamped on her features, the reality is sufficiently idealized to make even those despised characteristics interesting and touching, even in their unloveliness, <laughs> right? Nor must we be misunderstood so far as to have it supposed that because there is an ideality and elevation about the figure, it is necessarily fanciful and unlike the reality. It is full of truth, right? Nothing has been sacrificed to beauty. Nature has been faithfully rendered, and the result is a fine work of art. Here, the critic basically calls Bell some kind of alchemist. You have turned this ugly woman into a beautiful piece of sculpture. Um, and I think that the Octoroon ends up being kind of like a way to get around that, pro to try to get around that problem. To get to your question about kind of what happens later, 
We do have somebody like Archibald Motley Jr. Um, in the uh, late 20s up through uh, the very beginning of the 30s doing his scientific portraits. Um, I don't have those in, in this talk, but there's like Moulatris, uh, with a, a, a Dutch landscape, or Mulatris with figurine in a Dutch landscape, and then most famously, uh, two versions of the Octoroon, right? He gives his works, maybe it's worth kind of seeing if I can get online to, to show it. Um, he gives his, his works titles like um, the Octoroon and the Quadroon, and those come around the same time as. Feel like I'm in class where I don't put something in the PowerPoint and then I like <laughs> look it up on Google Images. Uh, right, like works like this one, right? This is his Quadroon Girl, which appeared as the cover of uh, one of the editions of Nella Larson's Passing, actually. Um, and this is the image, actually, that Motley makes of his white, white wife, Edith. Um, you can see them side by side, kind of right here. They're very similar. Um, so even then, you have artists kind of challenging, I think the through art, the kind of differences in the construction of race. And, and Motley did, though he said some very problematic things, um, uh, did consider himself a race man who was trying to um, use his work in the interest of science. And uh, well, I probably shouldn't have done that because now I have no more images. Uh, in the interest of science and, uh, and the people. Uh, hello, Professor. Thank you so much for your presentation and so generous on bringing so much information. So I think my questions are very connected to um, what has already been discussed. Uh, the first is um, if uh, the Octoroom is part of a larger project, meaning uh, you already show us the Daughter of Eve, but if uh, he had, I wonder if he had a series of the, the Quadroom, the Octoroom, the indigenous, the white, just because he's branded, uh, he has branded the, the sculptor. Uh, so I imagine uh, where are the others is my first question, so if, if there's others. Uh, and how important is, was race or miscegenation in, his, in overall his work? And um, what were, uh, if you know what were his thoughts about um, um, eugenics and some kind of ethnic cleansing or this kind of politics that were taking place in the second half of the 19th century? Um, yes, that is a great question. Um, Bell is no kind of a, I think that it's just like only working with one port, port so I'm gonna let it charge for a second and I'll switch it back. Um, Bell was definitely no sort of John Brown <laughs> with a chisel. Um, he was a committed abolitionist, um, but uh, he, th the works, The Daughter of Eve and The Octoroon are the only works that he's known to have done that engage with the idea of race or slavery directly. So there's no mulatto or quadroon version. Um, and, you know, I th he's really not interested in real people, <laughs> I think, in either of these works. Um, his Octoroon is very much, I would argue, rooted in a kind of stock character, this kind of figure that I've described, known through the literature rather than any kind of real person. And I think that's where a work like uh, Solomon's Mother of Moses, which features a real Afro-Jamaican woman living in Britain at the time, um, gets a kind of criticism that the, that the Octoroon sculpture um, doesn't. Um, he, Bell is probably most famously known for sculpting the America group for the Albert Memorial. He was a fashionable sculptor who did all kinds of just kind of like literary, biblical, um, and portraiture kind of work that was uh, popular during the day. So other than these two works, not like a huge political motivation. He does sculpt um, uh, a, a, another work that becomes known as the Obsidian Sleeve um, that becomes a Perry and Mer Ware miniature as well, um, which takes on like the idea of Ethiopia and piracy <laughs> was going on there at the time. Um, and so there are a couple of other figures in his of that might be described as ethnic, um, but in terms of having a kind of scientific project in, in like 
making a, a spectrum of race um, that was not on his agenda. My question is going to make sense, but um, it has to do with the place, the idea of place in your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you do emphasize a great deal that that, that this oriental picture was, uh, oh, sorry, Louisiana or New Orleans was being imagined, or you're bringing this oriental picture mm -hmm. to this place in Louisiana. Uh, so my question is that what's happening to the Octoroons in other parts of the South? Uh, I mean, it's, it's what is being imagined, or what is it? What I guess, can you talk a little bit about sure. how 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 Louisiana becomes or gets this image of, you know? It's because people hate Catholics. No, <laughs> um, I mean, I think that Louisiana becomes the sort of location um, for this particular kind of stock character because of. Louisiana's French history um, before it is purchased by the British and the fact that Louisiana already is, or purchased by the United States, sorry, um, that Louisiana already has this kind of exotic difference um, and already has a tripartite racial structure um, in which, um, unlike in the British colonies, which um, more closely adhered to a kind of one drop rule um, in which there was less of a distinction and less room for freedom if you were a person of mixed European and African descent. In Louisiana, there was a, a more um, elastic racial structure um, that was a result uh, largely of the French Catholic tradition. And we see this actually wherever the British take over, uh, or British or Anglo-inspired, in, in case of, you know, uh, or, or Anglo-generated, the United States buys, um, buys Louisiana. Uh, so, for example, in the British Caribbean, when uh, St. Vincent and Dominica are taken over by the British at the end of the Seven Years' War, all of the mulatresses that Augustino Brunius paints are one called mulatresses, right? Not mulatas, and are given the designation French. So if you look in the paintings that we have here in the Harvard collection, um, there are four, or um, well now there are six. We've, we found the other two that were missing. Um, there, it is French mulatresses purchasing fruit from a Negro woman. Negro or a Negro woman and mulatresses bathing. So it's always like this emphasis on using the French version of the word, oftentimes doubling down on that by adding French as a modifier as a way of, I think, creating a distance. Like, we didn't do that. We got nothing to do with those mulatresses. Even though it is a white face that is people, I'm thinking of a, of a woman, of a painting that I wrote about before, mulatresses is a Negro woman bathing, where there is a white kind of peeping Tom in the trees. It is clearly made for a British patron. Like, the Brits are not above watching the French mulatresses. <laughs> they just don't want to take any responsibility for making any of their own, right? So that is where I think that in terms of the kind of perception of this figure. It is rooted in Louisiana. That, of course, doesn't mean that there are not mixed race people across the South. Um, just in the literature, in the artwork, it becomes kind of focused on a particular location. What are the three categories? Uh, black, white. black, white, and of color. Of color. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, really quick. Thanks, uh, Mia, so much. Uh, just. To, Two things. I, it's interesting about why after, um, you know, after abolition is this so, uh, you know, this theme just continuing to, to rise. And I think about post reconstruction imagery in the United States and nostalgia, the nostalgia for the Old South. And I wonder, is there sort of a nostalgia going on with the sort of the interest in this, this Milatris figure? Uh, uh, nostalgia. Yeah, well, <laughs> nostalgia for these themes um, continuing in, in, you know, in, in, in England. But so that's one uh, thing. But also, thank you for, you know, your work is so influential when, in the exhibition that I did in England. And two of these works were there, the Octoroon, we got her, and we got the uh, 
you know, the, the um, Greek slave. And you've written about this, but I want you to tell, talk about the difference in the marble, like the, the actual piece of marble that it, the, uh, the octoroon is made of. It's dappled. It's got all of these, quote unquote, flaws. It's a lot of dark spots throughout. Um, and yeah, and, and it's, there's a sort of a, a, I guess, something we could look back on now and talk about, you know, the, 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 that issue. But and then the uh, Greek slave is pristine white piece of marble. It gleams and it shines. I mean, when you're in the room with these things, it's astonishing. So um, talk about, about that. Yeah, hopefully in a second. The slide will pop back on the screen. There we go. So you can see the striations here in the marble across the octoroon's back. Um, and they're also across her thighs. Um, so there is nothing that I've discovered um, so far that has Bell's particular kind of opinion. Obviously, uh, sculptors source their mar marble from different um, from different places, and we're not. Uh, you don't always know what you're going to get when you start like chipping into something. Um, so we don't know whether or not it was intentional um, that uh, Bell chooses a piece of marble that is less than pristine. Um, we do know that it was remarked upon when um, Blackburn goes to buy the sculpture. Um, they borrowed it at first for the opening of their uh, municipal museum and art gallery. Um, and with the promise that they would purchase it, Bell leaves it there for some extra time. Um, and then he's like, yo, like, I need my sculpture back if you're not going to buy it. Um, somebody gets all of their panties in a wad and raises a, subscrip a subscription through the newspaper to raise the money to buy the work. Um, because it is that important that it be the center of their uh, of their municipal art collection. And somewhere in the files, there was like, well, we should get some kind of reduction in price because, <laughs> you know, it's not pure marble. Um, and then a later, so a later file in the, in the Blackburn Museum and Art Gallery, a later kind of in the curatorial file, there's actually some gallery text that they wrote about kind of the... Um, what a kind of ironic, um, uh, what the kind of irony of getting a reduction in price for a less than pure, uh, the use of less than pure marble in a sculpture that in some ways was about like racial impurity. Um, so it is certainly a provocative um, feature of the work. I try to stay on the side of offering it again as a provocative speculation or you know like a tantalizing thing to think about um, since since we can't know what what bell really meant with it certainly i think that it was not obviously wasn't seen as a detriment didn't start over <laughs> right yeah i have to go to a meeting but it's fabulous thank you thank you May I ask you a provocative philosophical question? As you know, the concept of Orientalism had a specific political project, as Edward Said used mm -hmm. it. It was meant to problematize our understanding of the beautiful, an aesthetic standard as a relationship between the global south and the global north. If we go beyond the global north to understand the concept of the beautiful as a relationship among members of the global south, China, India, Japan, etc., etc., then the concept begins to diminish its fertility because it doesn't attend to, on the visual level, what the beautiful is. For example, I have two daughters, Chinese Ethiopian and Lebanese Ethiopian. As you can imagine, they are gorgeous. But their gorgeousness is problematized within the global south, among the, the Lebanese, among the Indians, among the Chinese, because visually, the concept of beauty by them has become racialized. Mm -hmm. Edward Said does not go there. 
Fanon does. So there is a tension between Fanon and Edward Said when Edward Said was alive. I always asked him this question, <laughs> and he shied away from addressing it. He was too close to Fanon, but also maintained the distance, which has something to do with something else. <laughs> I think that there is an invitation between in that tension to kind of tease apart or not tease apart isn't what I want is, isn't really what I want to say. Maybe it's more like to bring together the kind of thinking about aesthetics that um, is Said's part primary interest with the with, with to introduce the problematics of race into that aesthetic conversation in a way that, as you say, he might have been afraid to go. And I think a project like this allows for that in the sense that it is thinking about all of the things that Said observed about the aestheticization of the Orient and about producing a particular kind of beauty for the Western gaze. Um, and thinking about, again, not really applying it to real people, <laughs> um, but applying it to the perception um, of race and beauty in a specific location. I think that where there's also possibility there for this work to have more than just um, significance at the level of the object or the aesthetic is in thinking about how these ideas influence the way that the bodies of mixed race women are read for real every day on the street. Thanks so much for that, Mia. You have fielded a lot of questions. So maybe these are just, you can answer one or both or neither of these, and we can talk about it later. I was just curious if there is an archive of black responses to any of these works. I was thinking about, you know, the Greek slave was seen mm -hmm. by people like William Wells Brown, by the crafts, and they were, they toured there in a very public way, and that, Statue signifies very differently when you think about actual former slaves visiting that site. So I'm just curious to hear if there were similar kinds of resignifications with any of these figures. Actual for study. former slaves with bodies that looked like Ellen Craft's or body. Like, yeah, right? Right. So I yes. want you to imagine <laughs> what it means for a woman like Ellen Craft, who passed as a white woman. Mm -hmm. She was but, right, to stand in front of the Greek slave at the Crystal Palace. So Ellen Craft, William Craft, and a number of other um, uh, self-emancipated folks and uh, abolitionists staged a kind of protest, I guess you would call it, or an action happening uh, in front of the Greek slave. Um, and that is kind of the, when I'm thinking about like the perceptions of um, very, the, rear, the perceptions that we project onto the very real bodies of very real mixed race women. Um, Ellen Craft, when she had herself photographed, um, not as passing as uh, her husband's master, um, but when she was dolled up in feminine gear, um, was very, as many women were, uh, many women of Africa at, at the time, was very careful to be prim and proper and covered. And, you know, she's got the bonnet and the high necked dress and is the picture of kind of Victorian um, prim and properness, which is quite a contrast to a work like The Octoroon, in part because she is dispelling the kind of hypersexuality that is projected onto bodies like hers, right? Um, so in a way, I think of Ellen, and Ellen Craft's self-presentation, even in the way that she often kind of let William Craft do the talking when they were publicly, um, when, they were, when they presented themselves publicly, as a kind of black response to this kind of phenomenon. If we're talking about specifically like ob black object responses, um, from the 19th century, not really that I've found. Um, I think that uh, the few uh, 19th century artists of African, women artists of African descent um, that we know of in the United States 
were very <sighs> hesitant to represent the female body at all, especially the female body um, that could be attached to a specific kind of person or type. Um, and so um, often used flowers as a metaphor, <laughs> as I've, uh, uh, as Jasmine Cobb um, and I have written about elsewhere. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, Sarah Fortin has a, a pencil drawing of a kneeling enslaved woman in a friendship journal, um, which I argue is quite different than the kind of standard am I not a woman and a sister icon um, that also I think participates not necessarily in this conversation about um, a, a white looking um, body of African descent, but certainly participates in a conversation about how we are invited to look at the bodies of enslaved women. Um, she, in that work, which I call a remix, pairs that image with selected, very carefully selected stanzas of a white abolitionist poet's poetry. And instead of, for example, the first stanza, which is to the daughters of the pilgrim squires, um, which would obviously be addressed to white women, chooses this, uh, a different stanza, which starts with the word look and actually gives her reader viewer something to look at because she attaches a drawing of a woman there and then takes the, the reader viewer through a kind of understanding of what they are looking at in a way that I would say participates in a kind of resistance um, by a black woman. <laughs> it's amazing. You are such a great student. And 